Wyoming is a very curious place when it comes to historical anomalies. It is particularly rich with peculiar oparts. The rock art that spans many millennia of man's history, handprints seemingly melted into the solid stone within the white rocks of White Mountain, or indeed, the falling block. Although the name would suggest that this block is in a precarious position, it is in fact unliberated from the bedrock. Unquestionably reminiscent of the countless abruptly abandoned mines and quarries places such as Aswan in Egypt, Yangshan in China, Easter Island's El Gigante, and so on. Regardless, it is hastily dismissed as a geological formation. Its compelling characteristics, however, cannot be denied. Its unnatural shape, its leveled top, its out-of-place appearance, as if placed there or as if it had fallen from the sky. Not to mention the curious symmetrical patterning on certain sides, the same possible tool marks we have previously identified on stones. Within such gigantic megalithic sites as that of Gornea Shoria, another site littered with similarly sized blocks that are also argued as natural, yet the artificial characteristics present at the site would make this explanation unlikely. Located in the eastern part of the Bighorn, in a plateau northwest of the dihedral's wall, predictably little official study has been published in regard to the falling rock, although it is well known within rock climbing circles, indeed due to its symmetrical and seemingly worked shape, making it great for practice before taking on the bigger climbs. If such an object were to be located upon the surface of Mars, for example, it would undoubtedly create a flurry of interest due to its clearly artificial-esque form, yet because it is on Earth, and the truth of our past has been lost or worst hidden, it is simply ignored in favor of a more digestible and easier explanation. A dismissal of other possibilities, most probably made without any in-depth study being done on the area in line with such a hypothesis. It simply does not give one a sense of authority to say that they do not know. Additionally, during our research, we stumbled upon the medicine wheel, formerly known as the Bighorn Medicine Wheel. Paradoxically, it is argued as an indigenous artifact. This regardless of the open fact that no indigenous people have publicly claimed to have built the Bighorn Medicine Wheel. During negotiations to include the Bighorn Medicine Wheel to the Registry for National Historic Landmark and Sacred Site status, the Crow indicated that the wheel was already present when they came into the area. What do you feel about the peculiarities within Wyoming? Do you believe some were left by a lost civilization, particularly the falling rock? We find the falling rock, and indeed the history within Wyoming as a whole, highly compelling. In 1932, gold prospectors searching within the San Pedro Mountains of Wyoming would make a groundbreaking discovery, a find which, for a brief period of time, exposed to the world the past existence of a group of people, a secret, unexplainable race, which has been successfully covered up for over a century. Cast into the realm of folklore, this group of people could be attributed to tales of gnomes or hobbits. The once-native Crow people spoke of their ferocious nature for many hundreds of years. No taller than 36 inches in height, according to William R. Corliss in his 1978 book Ancient Man, a Handbook of Puzzling Artifacts, citing the Anthropological Institute, Journal 6, 100, 1876. An ancient little people graveyard of vast proportions was once found in Coffee County. It was estimated that there were as many as 100,000 separate individuals buried there. And in 1932, two gold prospectors would thankfully expose the existence of the little people of Priori Mountain to the world. Deep within a mine on the mountain, they discovered a secret lair, a tomb, somehow placed deep within the rock face. Within this tomb, they found the mummified remains of a tiny humanoid. Now known as Pedro, according to Dr. Henry Shapiro, an anthropologist from the American Museum of Natural History, along with the several x-rays he made, proving his authenticity, Pedro was 65 years old when he died and he had unfortunately suffered a terrible fall, which had dislocated several of the vertebrae in his back. 
It seemed to Dr. Shapiro, a head wound that he had apparently suffered some short time after may have been the result of his relinquished life, in a curious act of mercy by his fellow tribe members. The Crow tribe attest to these tiny people once being gifted warriors, feared by all those in the surrounding areas. They told of the little people murdering all who ventured near them, even decimating a group of 200 strong warriors who mistakenly trespassed into their territories during the night. Pedro ended up in a pharmacy in Wyoming, and for seven years he was a successful local attraction. One day, when an unusual businessman offered to buy him, after apparently paying a very large sum, the man disappeared with Pedro, and he has never been seen of again. The only existing mummy of the little people, it seems, was successfully confiscated during the late 1950s. To this day, it is not known where Pedro is, although for the person who locates his current residence, we have been made aware of a substantial cash prize for the person who can bring him back into the public arena or at least enable further testing. If you know where Pedro is, please do get in touch. There is someone with a rather large present waiting for you. When someone mentions the word Jurassic, visualizations of enormous creatures surrounded by man-eating plants will soon follow. And this is for good reason. Because during the era of the dinosaurs, enormous creatures could only survive with equally enormous food sources. Within the Black Hills of Dakota, petrified remains of these once enormous organisms can still be found. Presumably, they can also be discovered in many other parts of the world. Yet within the Black Hills, it seems the prehistoric remains have avoided the deluge of sediment, which has been experienced elsewhere subsequently burying the evidence under several meters of earth. Petrified, enormous trees that, when alive, would have soared into the air, matching in height many of today's modern skyscrapers. Open to the public in 1929, an entire island, 50 by 100 miles in size, covered with the perfectly preserved petrified remains of a once gigantic forest. Trees of incredible and seemingly impossible sizes, destroyed by a cataclysm which made them collapse in unison. Now recognized as one of the largest outcroppings of fossilized petrified wood anywhere on the surface of the Earth, it is a rare natural insight into the enormity of Earth's ancient wildlife. Quote, Here is just the beginning of an astounding photographic documentation of this petrified island a little glimpse of an entirely unknown condition upon the Earth. It is a major historical discovery that, if embraced, will cause major upheaval within the science and religious communities," said Joseph C. Bennett from BeholdGiants.com. Scientists assume that the maximum height of a tree was 425 feet from the ground. At this height, the tree's ability to pump nutrients is supposedly overcome by gravity. However, Joseph, along with several other astute researchers, have discovered the remnants of ancient trees within the area, which would have had a circumference of over a half a mile. The Devil's Tower, coincidentally also within Dakota, has been argued for many years by many people to actually be that of a once enormous petrified tree. The formation of its rocky surface does indeed appear to be reminiscent of tree bark, Yet many will argue against such a premise, or indeed the possibility, based on traditional rather than more modern and controversial understandings of the past capabilities of plant and animal life. Thankfully, as more research is undertaken and more become aware of these amazing places, the possibility becomes even more likely. Cave paintings and petroglyphs are undoubtedly some of the oldest and most interesting artworks found anywhere on Earth. Some of these artworks, found within the unforgiving terrain of the Great Outback within Australia, for example, have been dated at well over 10,000 years old. Illustrations in ochre that show many of the animals our distant ancestors loved or hunted, along with many other forms of artistic recreation. Like a time capsule allowing us to travel back, to peek into the minds of ancient man. Although these ancient artworks are undoubtedly important to our understanding of ancient man, 
there exists a number of other petroglyphs that are considerably different to these primitive achievements. Found within the White Mountain of Wyoming, there are a number of petroglyphic carvings that were seemingly made with nothing else than our ancestors' hands. These deep-set handprints were somehow left within solid sandstone, as if created by softening the rocks with their minds, hands, or perhaps voices alone. How did an ancient people manage to create these marks? Did our ancient ancestors somehow figure out how to soften stone? There are many sites all around the world which possess similarly enigmatic marks. Were they left by individuals capable of softening stone, or perhaps left upon the stones while not fully formed? To melt or soften stone requires immense heat, that which is usually only found within the center of the earth, or indeed the lava flows which spew forth from its core. One interesting theory regarding the possible softening of stones, created far back within antiquity, was initially discovered still been surviving within the minds of locals who surround the ancient sites of Peru, most notably Sacsayhuaman. A theory put forth to explain the shaping of stones within the fortress, regarded as a local legend by the first explorers of these sites. Percy Fawcett, as well as Hiram Bingham, who actually rediscovered Machu Picchu, noted that it was a liquid derived from plants, which was apparently known to the ancients to turn stone soft. In fact, in 1983, a Catholic priest attested to using the technique, actually achieving the softening of solid stones, although he was apparently unable to return the resulting flurry back to solid stone. Furthermore, according to other researchers, Jan Peter de Jong, Christopher Jordan, and Jesus Gamera, among others. Ancient walls within Cusco show evidence that ancient cultures used very high temperatures to shape them. This unknown process vitrified the surface of the blocks, turning them to glass. Based on these observations, Jong, Jordan, and Gamera speculated that ancient man possessed an advanced device which somehow allowed them to melt stone blocks. And although the petroglyphs of the White Mountains are yet to be fully studied by anyone, we feel they are probably the strongest piece of evidence of this lost process. They are undoubtedly highly compelling. <laughs>